Greetings, and this time in LGR, it's all about vintage compact disc read-only goodness. This is the Hitachi CDR-1503S, a CD-ROM drive for IBM PCs and compatibles that sold for $884 in the US when it first hit store shelves in 1987. Yeah, 1987. While this was by no means the first CD-ROM drive, it's certainly the oldest I've owned myself. Old enough that it predates the publishing of ISO 9660-1988, the international standard defining what a CD-ROM's logical layout should be. When Hitachi began manufacturing the CDR-1503S, many CD-ROMs instead used the High Sierra format, or HSF, to store and retrieve data. But seeing as ISO 9660 is a direct evolution of HSF, the 1503S does pretty well reading newer CD-ROMs. <laughs> I mean, pretty well in the sense that it performs the task, albeit really, really slowly. Being from 1987, the 1503S and its contemporaries only have a sequential transfer rate of up to 153 kilobytes per second, and spins disks at a leisurely rate between 200 and 535 RPM about the same as a standard audio CD player, a speed that retroactively became known as 1x, or single speed, after multi-speed CD drives came along years later. But this solemn slowness and overall obsolescence is precisely why I want to dive deeper into the experience today. Yeah, I know CD-ROMs themselves are an obsolete format these days, and I've done a whole video rambling on about the excitement of games and software and CDs already, but the only thing more exciting than obsolete media is even more obsolete obsolete media. Particularly since this drive hails from a time where IBM format HD floppy disks stored 1.2 or 1.44 megabytes, and most PC hard drives topped out at 30 or 40 megs. Then came this thin plastic disk offering 550 megabytes or more, accessed using radiation-emitting lasers. Ah, cutting-edge leaps in tech this massive only come around once in a generation. So let's take a look back at a technological future that has already come and gone. A time when CD-ROM drives were bigger, slower, harder to use, and far more expensive. Although expensive didn't exactly equate to failure in this case, since despite costing almost $2,000 adjusted for inflation, the CDR-1503S was one of the more popular drives at the time. First announced in April of 87, it was actually one of the smaller, lighter standalone drives on the market, and one of the first to include both CD-ROM data storage and audio CD capability built into the same unit. It was followed shortly by the Amdek Laser Drive 1, also in 87, a drive that was practically identical other than the front faceplate. It was even blatantly listed as being a rebadged 1503S in some catalogs to make this clear, and from what I can tell, certain retailers agreed to sell Amdex, and others sold Hitachi. With technology chains like Computerland being a primary retailer for Amdek laser drives, and Radio Shack being one of the largest stores selling Hitachi drives, often alongside Tandy 1000s. These drives were also quite popular with software developers, notably Microsoft, who were often seen using Amdek units in late 80s promotional material showing their dedication to CD-ROM software development. Something they followed through on in the coming years, with programs like Microsoft Bookshelf being one of the earliest pieces of commercial software distributed exclusively on CD-ROM. A bookshelf on a compact disc, ooh, imagine that! It hasn't been done yet, but all this information could fit on a CD. Can't wait! Though unless you were loaded, most people had to wait, since Microsoft Bookshelf ended up costing $295 when it released in 1987. Yeah, that's nearly $700 for a single CD-ROM disc in today's currency. For a time, CD-ROMs were a legit status symbol. Just imagine rolling out of your local Radio Shack with one of these boxes in hand, solidifying your status as an absolute baller of a computer user. And when you opened the box, inside was an assortment of goodies ready to make your CD-ROM experience come to life. But before setting everything up, you gotta take a moment to admire the laser-powered beast itself. 
measuring 12 and a half inches across and weighing nine pounds, four ounces, this thing could practically pass for a miniature desktop computer. Miniature for the time anyway, as it looks positively petite compared to the monumental machines it was designed to work with. Apparently it was impressive enough to win the vaguely named Electronic Industries Design and Engineering Award, whatever that was. And I mean, if you like quadrilaterals, it is quite the pleasing design. There are three LEDs indicating power, disc activity, and tray functions, as well as a volume knob and 3.5mm headphone jack for audio playback. And of course, the clicky eject button and front-loading CD tray. Rather modern looking, all things considered, so many other CD-ROMs back then utilized top-loading CD trays or even caddy-loading mechanisms where you'd plop a disc inside a case before insertion. But not here. This is the same kind of drawer loader that became the norm in half-height drives for years. Though it does have this springy little tray in the middle here with some nice velvety strips for CDs to lounge on before being mounted inside. Classy stuff right there. Sadly, this is one of the many old drives that have suffered from rubber degradation, so chances are it'll need a belt replacement for the tray to properly eject. Not a particularly difficult task, but an undoubtedly annoying one, considering the placement of the belt and how fiddly the whole mechanism is. And hey, while we're here, check out that main PCB. It's a delightfully orangey thing, sparsely populated with an assortment of crispy clean components. I haven't been able to find any schematics or parts lists and the manual it came with is zero help, but it's an amusing thing to look at anyway. And check out this little blue board sticking up. I like how they just stuck a piece of plastic on there to kind of hold it in place vertically. And this warning label, DANGER! Invisible laser radiation when open and interlock failed or defeated, avoid direct exposure to beam. Neat. I also like these disc handling instructions in the manual, especially the cute little CD-ROM character. The poor little guy just wants to be handled with care, but instead it's subjected to screwdrivers, fingernails, bleach, ink pens, bending, hair dryers, geez, this is a straight up CD-ROM snuff comic. Anyway, back to the hardware, where around back you have the power switch, a permanently attached power cord, two Hitachi interface connectors, a drive select knob, and stereo RCA audio outputs for connecting to amplified speakers. You may be wondering, like I was, why there are two interface connectors, and well, it turns out the 1503S supports daisy chaining, with up to four drives able to be connected to one PC. <laughs> what a ridiculous sight that would have been back in the day. All this for just over two gigabytes of storage? Worth it. An alternative was the Hitachi CDR3500 Tower, a monstrous 4-in-1 unit that offered the same functionality as four 1503s in a smaller footprint and costing roughly $4,000. All this multi-drive capability is where that little drive select switch comes in, with drives 0 through 3 being part of the daisy chain, or just select NDS if you're a poor sap with only one lonely drive. As for connecting this to a computer, a compatible Hitachi CD-ROM controller card and interface cable is required, something thankfully included in the box. Without these and the appropriate drivers, you're out of luck. This was before the days of widespread IDE, and every major manufacturer had their own proprietary CD-ROM interface to deal with. Once the card is installed in a free 8-bit ISA slot, it's simply a matter of connecting the cable to one of the connectors on the rear of the drive. Doesn't matter which one you use, both left and right function the same when a single drive is connected, and it'll automatically terminate any other drives in a daisy chain. Finally, it's time to address the software side of things. My particular 1503 here came with two sets of drivers and software and five and a quarter inch floppy disk. One for older releases of MS-DOS and the other one for newer DOS versions and IBM PS2s. Since I'm using my IBM XT286 here with MS-DOS 6.0, I'll be using the newer release since it comes with Microsoft CD Extensions 2.10. And with that, Let's give our freshly installed 1987 CD-ROM setup a restart and try out some classic software. All right, now with everything all set up in terms of software, you can see that it loads the CD-ROM driver right there, as well as the Microsoft CD extensions, as that's doing that in the background here. Takes a moment, it is a 286. 
but once it gets that going, the CD-ROM should be ready to go because it's set up auto-exec and config sys to just do that automatically on startup. And yeah, there we go. Got a version 2.10 there, and it has assigned the CD-ROM to drive D, which is this right here. Of course, we don't have anything in here right now, so let us install or insert a CD and install a thing. And for this, I'm going to go with this bit of history right here. This is Microsoft Bookshelf from 1987. But this is definitely one of the very earliest CD-ROM softwares that was released, so it uh, seems quite appropriate. In fact, there's a lot of references in old magazines, newspapers, and everything to Microsoft Bookshelf being packaged with the Amdeck and Hitachi CD-ROM here. And yeah, check that out. We've got a directory reading all those 1987 file dates. My goodness. It is pretty wild seeing a CD-ROM of this vintage. This is a bit different to some of the later Microsoft Bookshelf things, which were kind of more of a standalone program from what I recall, especially for like Windows 95 and 98 ones. But this, well, it says standalone, but... <laughs> It's more of a TSR. I mean, that's exactly what it is. So this runs in the background and actually adds bookshelf capabilities to certain programs. So we will just go ahead and install this here. The first thing it needs to know is if you have a hard disk, we do. So we will put this to the bookshelf directory on the C drive and it copies over a few of the files that it needs. Love that little busy light. Look at that. <laughs> Oh man, this thing is absurdly slow. But anyway, needs a workspace in order to store your temporary files. We'll put that on the hard disk as well. And you could just run this straight out of a RAM disk, but we're not gonna do that. We have a hard disk. So yeah, it's gonna add some things to autoexec to tell the program that there is a CD drive right here and it needs to look for it. And there we go. So see, it's added these things here. Set CD path, bookshelf, and then some paths to the CD-ROMs software and book directories, folders. And when you actually run this, like not much happens. It loads it into RAM and it'll just stay there. So it puts up this thing and it's like, it's running, <laughs> but it's just running in the background. So you can try to open it up again. Yeah, it's already loaded. So it's here just kind of hanging out until you do something else. So you'll need to run one of these supported programs and it pretty much supports anything that was a text uh, editor, word processor kind of thing. So yeah, Microsoft Word, of course, Word Perfect. I think I have Word Perfect 5.1, so we'll do that. That lovely sound you're hearing is the hard disk, by the way. The CD-ROM is like seriously silent. It's so slow and accesses things so infrequently that you really don't ever hear it. You know, during normal loading of programs and such, it doesn't really make much noise. It's trying really hard to get those words absolutely perfect. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so this is just normal word perfect here. You can type things like this and such. So you know, whatever. Uh, but to access Microsoft Bookshelf, you actually hold down left, alt, and shift. And check this out. You've got this at the top that pops up. And it says unknown um, because it doesn't actually recognize this version of WordPerfect. It was designed for earlier ones, but it still works. Um, so you just press like one of the, uh, the things here, these little drop down menus, and you can access whatever you need to from the CD-ROM just like this. So for instance, if we were to open up the dictionary, we can have the uh, most recently entered word and look that up. And it'll search the CD-ROM for it and find it. Look at that, like, oh man. <laughs> it is pretty exceptional for 1987. So much information just streaming directly off of the CD. I mean, may not seem ridiculously impressive nowadays, but 
goodness, in 1987, you know it was. I mean, it even was in the 90s having so much information on just a CD, but uh, yeah, this and DOS and WordPerfect, like this just adds so much functionality. Uh, you got one of the, what is this? One of the Chicago something or other. Yeah, manual of style. You got the whole thing right here. All this stuff. Look up abbreviations. Here's how to abbreviate things. Dude, just streaming directly off of that. Impressive. We've got a full almanac here. Which almanac is it? The World Almanac of Books or uh, and Book of Facts. Uh, look at all these. Oh man, we can look up agriculture just like that. Wow. Oh man extremely handy stuff in the days before the internet and you'd have to have like all sorts of reference guides and books out to look this kind of stuff up and the fact that it takes so relatively long to stream in line by line makes it extra impressive to me it reminds me of looking into like a a really advanced bulletin board so yeah check it out you just select who you want here or search for who you want in the search menu and you've got the famous quotes from these folks Man, it's cool. Yeah, all, all things considered, <laughs> relatively speaking. <laughs> so anyway, that's how Microsoft Bookshelf works. And this is just one of many examples of early CD-ROMs, which uh, unfortunately, even though there were a bunch of them, all these reference materials and educational things and such, this is the only one I have. These are actually really hard to find. This took me forever to find. I had to import it and it took like three or four months, I forget, like, yeah, a long time to show up because uh, of all the things going on globally, shipping's all messed up right now, but I was very happy to find this because this is the only copy I've ever seen. There wasn't even an archive of it online. There is now. Games weren't really a thing yet for, uh, for CDs. You had more stuff like along this line, like the National Telephone Directory on CD-ROM. <laughs> this is a bit later. I think this is from 1993. But look at this nonsense. You have a CD for each region around the U.S. and then one for businesses. But uh, yeah, you can just, you can search for, this is effectively a really glorified white pages. Just gonna look up the South here. And each one of these CDs is almost uh, 600 megabytes of pure text data with searching capabilities. Picked this up at a Goodwill a while back. Uh, and again, it's one of those things where you do install it, but it doesn't actually put very much in your hard disk. Really, that was the whole point. A lot of these early CDs, like pretty much all of them, you just have a basic little thing you'd put on a hard disk or a floppy disk or RAM disk or whatever. And it's just, it tells the program where to look for stuff. And that's about it because everything was meant to stream off of that CD. Drive letter is D for the CD. So there we go. Regional installation complete. All right. So it uh, put some batch files for us here. We can just type in Pro CD and it will open it up. Profone 1993, software version 2.2. So yeah, this is the National Telephone Directory on CD-ROM. And there is, like I said, a lot of information on here. I think they release these like once every quarter. <laughs> and yeah, th that's, that's all this is. Uh, you can either just browse one by one here it is amazing how many businesses start with A1 or AA or triple A. It's <laughs> There's so much. Look at all those A1s. This is just the South region here. So, uh, oops, held down page down too long. It's just going to keep doing this. Okay. Um, but yeah, the other way, of course, that you can, you can do this is just typing in things. So if we want to go to the, the K's, there we go. And we can just browse these. And that's pretty much all this is. You can just look up things that you would see in uh, your white pages or whatever kind of reference would have this information back then. Instead of going to, uh, you know, your big book that you have at home or to a library or whatever. Because this has a lot more than just your standard white pages or yellow pages. So it's just it addresses names and phone numbers. And um, well, you know, one cool thing you could do, of course, is just print things out. 
a uh, nice handy reference there. I don't have a printer plugged in, but you know, it would print things. <laughs> and then you can press F2 to dial local or long distance numbers. So if you had a modem installed that you could dial out through the landline, you could do that right here. Just set the COM port and whatever else, and it'll just straight up dial. Uh, the, the, the phone numbers, you don't even have to figure it out. You don't have to figure it out, man. All those buttons on a touch-tone phone are so confusing. You can just have your computer do it. Honestly, just just absolutely futuristic stuff. The fact that you're also getting it from a CD-ROM, you know? <laughs> All these radio stations. That's enough of that. So the final thing I do want to try out here are some games. I know they said there weren't really too many games on CD, and... Uh, there weren't when this came out, but of course that definitely changed later on and uh, This computer doesn't support most of the CD games you might think about from the early 90s you now your seventh guests and uh, Mist and whatnot, but it does of course support the billions of shareware compilations Like Game Empire here. This one was a pretty darn popular one and this one is a DOS uh, CD, so this will run just fine not everything that's on here will run, because this is only a 286 with EGA graphics. No sound card, but, uh, yeah. It'll open it up at least, so we can see some things. And check it out. There's a lot of stuff on here, man. A lot of classics. The adventure games, a lot of these aren't really adventure games, but yeah, you got the Hugo games. Hugo is always good. Last Half of Darkness. That is how uh, we discovered that one. <laughs> uh, was this compilation right here. Strategy games. Look at that. Balloon challenges on here. Heck yeah, man. I go for some card games. I'm in the mood for some blackjack. So yeah, you can run it from the hard drive. It'll just copy it over. Or run it directly from the CD. It'll pop up an error or like a warning that you might get an error. Because, yeah, you can't obviously write to anything, so high scores and configurations won't be saving unless somehow the game knows that it's streaming off the CD and it'll put some configurations on the hard disk, but... Anyway. Blackjack! <laughs> this will take forever to render. It puts, like, this whole rounded... just bunch of cards on the screen. That'll take absolutely forever, so let's not watch that. My bet. Let's just bet it all. I'm feeling lucky. I've got a CD-ROM drive. All right, a 16. Great. Eh, I'll hit. Feeling lucky. Oh, ho, ho. wow. Lucky CD-ROM. Wasn't expecting that. All right. Just go until I bust. Got an 18. All right, I'm gonna stay. Nice. Dealer bust. Let's go. Got 600. <laughs> it's got a 20? All right. Fine. Fine, fine, fine. Wow, I am just winning today, dude. Should buy myself a lottery ticket. Yeah, there's a lot of... I'm trying to think what else is on here that would work straight away. I mean, I know a lot does, but... Actually, I know one thing that'll be pretty cool. We've got... Yeah, EGA Golf here in the mixed games. Some of these categories. And we'll run this straight off of the CD. There is something extremely novel about the whole experience here. I uh, hope it's not just me, but this is fun. This is a demo version of Caddy Hack from Myco Developments. That it is. It's basically shareware, though. It's got a whole big chunk of the game you can play. The price you pay for not paying any price. You gotta sit through all this. Isn't that charming? All right. One player. Play on the one course that it allows. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, add some sounds. <laughs> Select your tree. We get to select trees. I'm gonna go with palm trees because I don't know, man. EGA palm trees. And so, yeah, it pretty much controls like any other golf game, but this is a little bit different. Uh, so for instance, if I were to do full power and then you think accuracy would be in the middle, 
but I just missed the ball. <laughs> so you have to go like up here and then down here. Okay, and so that just sliced like crazy. But I'm not in the water. I thought I would be in the water. Wow, okay. So we'll try that again. That's pretty much what you want to do. Wow, I'm not in the water again. That is extremely lucky. Let's do right here. Oh, <laughs> right in the water again. Okay. Mink. Oh. Well, I just love the way this looks. Look at that. It's much different than something like World Class Leaderboard. As much as I enjoy that, that has all those like bitmapped kind of graphics and this is just filled line art. It's got this pseudo 3D thing going on that's just fantastic, I think. And you have a caddy that's automatically selecting your iron and such, so you don't even have to worry about that. I think you can change that if you want, but typically the caddy's pretty darn good about choosing the right uh, wedge or iron or whatever you need. I'm just gonna just completely tank. This is awful. Oh no, it got across. Sweet. Let's try this. Oh, no. So anyway, that is the CD-ROM, at least in terms of running CD-ROMs. One more thing that I want to show, though, is audio discs. Because yes, this does CD audio. Uh, you got the headphones here, of course. And then around back, we have the uh, stereo output, which I have hooked to some speakers. And I'm just going to play the... A CD here that <laughs> was sent to me by Tame Impala because I bought tickets to go see one of their shows this summer. And of course that got canceled, but they sent the CD anyway. So this is like the only audio CD that I have right now. Anyway, um, I, I guess now that I think about it, I can't actually play this because copyrighted stuff, whatever. I'll show you how it works anyway. So there's this program called CD Play. It came with a whole lot of different CD drives back in the day. Uh, this is the Sony version of it, but it still works with this. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, that's cool. So yeah, this is a compact disc audio player for DOS. You got all your commands here that you'd expect to see, you know, your shuffles and you can program things in and repeat and whatever. You can run it in the background, like as you've got other things going on. So it'll act as like a TSR if you need it to. Pretty darn cool, actually. So yeah, you can select your track over here. Uh, I'm gonna have to mute this because it's copyrighted music, but whatever. CD audio. Yeah, you love that new sound of Tame Impala. They've really changed up their whole groove. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, yeah, you can have an eject button right here, software eject. For some reason, that is really impressive to me because it's DOS. It doesn't actually go back in, but you know, whatever, it's cool. And about the only other thing I want to mention really quick at the end here is, does it play burned CD-ROMs or does it read them? Uh, yes, it does actually. So I've got one that I just wrote here nothing special about it didn't actually <laughs> even write it very slowly it's just on a modern cd recordable there and yeah so far i've had no problems running burned cd roms so that's nice let's dig around in dos games backslash arcade 2 backslash godmom 30 a uh, classic of sorts that i remember from childhood f godmom yeah, good old Fairy Godmom from Soggy Bread Software. And yeah, just streaming right off a CD like everything else. I mean, you know, these aren't necessarily really hard to run programs that I'm pulling off the CD here, but uh, still. It's just cool that you can do it, which is, uh, yeah, that about sums up the entire CD-ROM experience with this particular drive. It's big, it's slow, it's ridiculous, <laughs> you know. There's no real reason to use it, except that it's fun. And it's, uh, 
oddly fascinating to be restricted like this, but yet at the same time so freed. Uh, and yeah, if you remember, like, what was the first thing that you ever remember seeing on CD-ROM? Like, in terms of software, especially if it was like an application or something, I'm always curious to hear that. Because, uh, for a lot of folks, it sure seems to be something like encyclopedia or a reference material of some kind. Oh no, am I gonna screw this up? Ah! I turned the exit into a ladder. Dang it. <laughs> well, that's that. I hope that you enjoyed this. And if you did, why not check out some of my other videos on all kinds of retro computing topics and other things as I post new stuff every week here on LGR. And as always, thank you very much for watching.